For most of my life I was very conventional. For 11 years I worked as a management consultant in a cubicle in a London office. I might have daydreamed about big adventures, but I never actually believed I would have one of my own. My name is Ros Savage and I'm an ocean rower. In the year 2000, I had everything that was supposed to make me happy. I had the well-paid job, big house in West London, husband, and uh, a little red sports car. But there was just something wrong. I didn't feel fulfilled. I didn't feel like I was living in accordance with my life purpose. I knew I had a purpose, and I didn't know what it was, but I was pretty sure that management consultancy, which is what I was doing at the time, was not it. I sat down and I wrote two versions of my own obituary, the one that I wanted and the one that I was heading for. And when I looked at them, they were very, very different and I realised that I needed to make some big changes. I realised that life was much more about who I was and not what I owned. And I was trying to find a project that would be like the perfect expression of these new values. When the idea to row across oceans came to me, it just seemed absolutely perfect. It just checks all the boxes. It was environmentally friendly. It was adventurous. It would allow me an opportunity for personal growth. And it was sufficiently unusual. It's Christmas Day 2004. And because I've been a good little girl this year, or because Santa was looking the other way when I was being a naughty girl, I've got a lovely new toy, my water rower rowing machine, which has just had its first ever proper workout. And I'm very, very sweaty. And as you can see, it's now rather steamy in my mother's conservatory. But I uh, had to earn my turkey somehow. At that time, I had absolutely no relevant experience whatsoever. I had rowed, but I'd never been to sea, and it was a pretty steep learning curve. I just sat down and wrote a long list of all the things that I would need to do to make it happen. I just thought to myself, well, supposing I were going to go and row across an ocean, what would I need to do? And by the time I'd finished writing this list and looked down it, I thought, well, there isn't actually anything on there that I can't do. So the whole project started to seem frighteningly doable. Rolls has already had a most amazingly varied and interesting life. On November the 27th this year, I'm going to be setting out from the Canaries to row across 3,000 miles of ocean to Antigua in the Caribbean. I'm going to be the only solo female entry in the Atlantic rowing race this year. There are 50 other entries, most of them are pairs, there are a few fours, and there are four other singles, but they're all guys. So that leaves me as the only person in the solo female class. So if I make it across to the other side in one piece, then I win. Yes. <laughs> in the run-up to the Atlantic Row, I trained for up to 16 hours in a day for five Sundays in a row. I did 16 hours on the rowing machine, starting at noon on a Sunday and finishing around about breakfast time on a Monday. I just wanted to make sure that I arrived at the start line as well prepared as I could possibly be.
here I am. After 14 months of preparation, it's really happening. This is where it stops being about um, spreadsheets and designs and raising money and training on a rowing machine. And this is where it becomes rowing on the Atlantic Ocean. Physically, I was struggling almost from the start. Once the seasickness wore off, then the tendonitis in the shoulders began. That definitely had a negative effect on my psychological state. It's very difficult to stay cheerful and positive when you're in pain almost constantly. just finished my first three hour rowing shift and um, physically I feel like I'm just falling to pieces at the moment. Um, I've had shoulder trouble throughout, um, throughout this row and um, at the moment my right shoulder blade is giving me serious jip despite all the painkillers. Um, I'm also getting a bit of a creak in my ribs on the left side. So, um, oh, and my bum is really sore, really sore. You don't want to see it. Um, so, just surviving on painkillers at the moment. I think I was actually quite depressed for a while, just really struggling to get my head around this enormous challenge that I'd taken on and realising that I was going to be out there for at least three months. It was really, really tough and it took me quite a while to actually learn the lesson that I just had to break it down into tiny little pieces and just take it one day or one rowing shift or one hour or even just the next 10 strokes at a time. Well, I'm sorry, but sod it. If I end up being a member of the 100 day club then so be it, but I just cannot stand this night rowing. It's just, it's too dark, I just can't see what I'm doing, the water's all bobbly, I keep taking air strokes, it's just, it's all very well for Rosie Stancer at the poles because it's 24 hour daylight there, but um, here in the dark I just, I make no progress and it just makes me tired and pissed off. I'm not having a good day. I thought I'd try a little experiment with a sea anchor, see if I could maybe harness the current, um, because it was I thought it was just the wind that was pushing me north. So um, I gave that a try, but it didn't work at all. Um, there must be a current pushing me north as well, um, because although it slowed the rate of the drift, um, it really didn't help a great deal. And in fact, it ended up just being a very frustrating exercise because the sea anchor got all kind of tangled up and I ended up having to cut one of the ropes and it I just ended up on the deck on all fours just yelling just just screaming with frustration and anger and I'm just at my wits end it's hard to tell you just how much I don't want to do this it just the thought of it almost makes me cry The year 
when I rode across the Atlantic was one of the worst years for weather ever in the North Atlantic. It was the year of Hurricane Katrina and there was a much higher than average number of tropical storms and I ran into quite a number of storms out there and it was pretty scary and there were quite a number of days when the, the wind was blowing me backwards and I had to put out the sea anchor to try and mitigate the backwards drift uh, so I couldn't row when the sea anchor was out and I still lost a few miles despite the sea anchor. This is the trouble with oceans. It seems to be always not enough of something or too much of it. So I thought I was pretty much prepared for every eventuality, but life does spring surprises on you, or specifically the ocean springs surprises on you. So all four of my oars broke before I reached halfway. So I just had to look around the boat and see what I had and figure out how I was going to fix them. So I got this boat hook, which is like a long pole with a hook on the end, and split that in two and used that as splints, bound tightly to the oars with duct tape, and I rowed more than half an ocean with these patched up oars. And they certainly didn't help my shoulder condition, but they did get me all the way across. Something really special happened on Valentine's Day. I'd had a link in with the Royal Navy. They'd been very supportive in the run up to my row. And they'd said that they were going to try and visit me if they happened to have a ship crossing the Atlantic while I was out there. So it just so happened that on Valentine's Day, they had a ship that was sailing from Grenada back to the UK. And so we managed to rendezvous in the middle of the ocean. So I'm just rowing along and sort of glanced over my shoulder and suddenly there's this great big grey battleship there. So they were able to launch this little inflatable boat and came bouncing across the waves towards me and brought me this Valentine's card in a, in a waterproof bag. It's Friday the 17th of February and I've been at sea for, um, let me see, um, 62 plus, uh, 79 days now and still 541 miles to go and um, I can't get my sat phone to work. It looks like I may be incommunicado for um, the remainder of my voyage but um, <laughs> In fact, I'd be quite happy about that. Two weeks of utter solitude sounds like my idea of heaven. Sunday the 19th of February, my second day without any contact with the outside world. And I can't tell you, I'm just, I'm loving it. I have never known peace like it. I'm starting to feel that I'm regaining my energy. I've just been rowing along this afternoon feeling so, serene and calm it's just been one of those really magic moments um, if I could bottle that feeling I'd make millions this is what the whole row so far has been leading up to this time for me just to be totally on my own um, so much learning that I've done um, about myself about about rowing an ocean um, and it's like this is the culmination of all that and everything has now got the opportunity to actually sort of bed in and be tested out and really fall into place. Towards the end though the physical side mattered less to me because I was getting the hang of it psychologically. It was a very steep learning curve and I really did learn a lot about how to cope with big challenges and really how to manage my thoughts. I learned what things I could cope with thinking about and which things were just going to make me feel overwhelmed or depressed. And I became very good at that thought management and just trying to focus on the positive. On the positive side, I am quite pleased with the way that I'm managing to hold it all together despite um, not being able to whinge to anybody about my plight um, since the sat phone stopped working. Um, I'm still sane-ish, um, still holding discipline together, sticking to my 12 hours of rowing a day. Um, so I'm really 
quite quite proud of that because I'm I'm not sure that everybody would hold it together in these rather trying circumstances. Um, so yeah, what can I do? I just um, just keep going, just keep rowing, and hope that one day I might get to Antigua. I'm trying to recognize the distance between here and where I started. Can I lift my head high above the haze so I can close the door on this quiet, blindsided face? I don't know what choice to make And I don't know what chance to take What to let go And what to hold near Cause I keep thinking with the passing of every day All the complications will eventually fall away But then I'm faced with the waste of yet Increasingly clear I can't stay here Monday the 6th of March Absolute dead calm and this is choppy compared with what it was like first thing. It was like a mill pond. But the silence out here is just so complete and profound. So I've been making some contingency plans. Well, actually, for much of the day, I just sort of mooched in a faintly depressed mood, um, lay around on my bunk and um, looked out at the wind and the waves and thinking what fantastic conditions. Um, the trouble is I'm stuck on the sea anchor. I can't go anywhere because uh, the trip line to the sea anchor um, first of all failed um, and then snapped altogether and there is no way that I can pull in a para anchor with a ton of seawater in it. Yes, options are the Aurora helps me retrieve the sea anchor. I ask for tow from here. Nope, definitely not too far. Or I stay on the sea anchor and wait for the wind to change. Or as I just said, there's a limit to how long I feel I can wait. Or I cut the line to the sea anchor, which is looking like an increasingly attractive option. I spent a lot of the early stages of the row just mentally fighting things, thinking the weather isn't supposed to be doing this and the ocean is not supposed to be this rough and my shoulders aren't supposed to be hurting. Before I just realised, well, 
that's just the way it is. All four of my oars broke, my camping stove broke, nav instruments broke, and I just had to figure out a way to deal with it, either to repair the thing or how to manage without it. You just have to go out of there believing that you'll cope with whatever life chooses to throw at you. And that was one of the reasons that I wanted to do this. Because for so much of my life I'd been dependent on parents or boyfriend or husband to, to look after me and fix things. And I just really wanted to find out what I was capable of. It doesn't matter the person that I was at the start of the race. She doesn't exist anymore. The last day, I remember getting up and uh, I knew I was getting very close um, because I, I could see from my, my chart plot of position that land was getting nearby. And when I finally saw this silhouette on the horizon of Antigua, I was just like, I'm gonna get there today if it kills me. So I just canceled all my breaks. I just rode solidly for 12 hours, started at 4 a.m., arrived at 4.30 p.m. It was just so fantastic that last day. I was just so full of energy. I was just so yearning to be back on dry land. And it was just amazing to get there. The Harbour Master's boat came out to, to greet me. My mum, it was so lovely to see her again. And my first words to her were, Mum, we did it. So you could think, well, What's the point in taking the next stroke? It's not going to really produce anything. But you take lots of tiny little actions and you string them all together. And eventually, you've rowed across an ocean. And that's just such a great metaphor for so many things. And I just have to keep reminding myself of that lesson whenever I feel like a, a challenge or a, a problem is so huge and so intractable that I don't even know where to begin with it. I just have to think, well, start at the beginning and just take it one stroke at a time.